Dobry wieczór, good evening, and welcome to the Ukrainian Institute of America, tonight's host. My name is Andrew Horodowski. I'm a member of the Ukrainian Institute of America and have a good fortune of working with Dr. Walter Hoydush, Chairman of the Programming Committee and Executive Director Olena Sidlovich on projects related to the art at the Institute and recently books at the Institute. They continuously prove to be leaders who set a fine institutional example for our public and member constituency, make for close collaborators and embrace a warm friendship. Thank you both. Olena is coordinating tonight's technical aspects for the Zoom event. Books at the Institute is a recent initiative born of our broader programming, enabling the public to engage with authors, presenting new works on relevant topics, addressing Ukraine and Ukrainian literary culture, art, society, historical and philosophical thought, and journalism. This evening's event is co-sponsored by the Shevchenko Scientific Society, the Ukrainian Academy of Arts and Sciences. We appreciate their valuable academic and community contributions participation and fellowship. We are very excited to welcome tonight's special guest, distinguished historian, professor, and author, Serhii Plokhi. His last book, Forgotten Bastards of the Eastern Front, American Airmen Behind the Soviet Lines and the Collapse of the Grand Alliance was published by Oxford University Press. And tonight we are honored to have Professor Plokhi return to the UIA. During this virtual Zoom presentation, I encourage you to record questions in the questions and comments panel on this platform for Professor Plocky about, about, about his efforts regarding his journey in realizing this project. I'm sure stimulating conversation will ensue to everyone's benefit. Unfortunately, we cannot meet in person tonight and in lieu of the opportunity of purchasing a book and a signing, we will be asking for donations online throughout to support the Ukrainian Institute's volunteer-led cultural and educational programming and further enjoyment of its unique events by our friends and community along New York's museum model. I'm, I'm sorry, museum mile. I can't help to think right or wrong that reading any subject of study needs justification. Its advocates must explain why it's worth attention. Most widely accepted subjects, and history is certainly one of them, attract some people who simply like the information and modes of thought involved. But audiences less spontaneously drawn to the subject and more doubtful about why they bother to and need to know about what the purpose is. I'm not a social or political historian and admit to being intimidated by some dense discourse related to a topic of study not approximate to my own familiarity. I do, however, and ever thankful to my late parents and their intellectual pursuits, select teachers and an act of curiosity love to read. When I received my copy of uh, Professor Plucky's Forgotten Bastards of the Eastern Front, I took to it not immediately for its complex subject at hand, but as a lay student of World War II's European fronts with newfound interest in the premise of its little known and curious story. So what is this account that has been ignored down through the decades? For a short time in 1944 and 1945, there were American air bases inside Soviet occupied Eastern Ukraine. Hundreds of American B-17 bombers, also known as flying fortresses, flew in and out missions to bomb targets in Germany and in Axis-occupied or Axis-allied Central Europe. These targets would have been out of reach if the planes had had to return to their bases in Britain or Italy, and striking them effectively was beyond the abilities of Soviet air forces. A series of missions under the code name Frantic started in England or Italy, attacked targets in Central Europe and landed airfields near, near the city of Poltava. They then refueled, reloaded and attacked Nazi held targets on the way back to their home bases in Western Europe. 
with access to newly released Western and Soviet era records, Plocky looks not just at the diplomatic wrangling and the military work that made the bombing missions possible, but also the clash of cultures that would put the two allies on a collision course. His thesis is that the Cold War did not start in the aftermath of World War II and the establishment of the Iron Curtain, but at the Poltava airfields and the eye-opening treatment that American airmen experienced by the Soviets. In less skilled hands than Plokis, the US shuttle bombing operations might, not have, might, might have seemed nothing more than a glorified footnote. In fact, the theme emerging from this brilliantly researched book is that the Cold War was already brewing in 1944. I will defer to the professor to expound on this extraordinary piece of consequential history in detail. Serhii Plokhi is Mikhail Hushowski Professor of History and Director of the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University, where he also serves on the Executive Committee of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. He is the author of over a dozen books on the history of Eastern Europe and the Cold War, including Yalta, The Price of Peace, The Gates of Europe, A History of Ukraine, The Last Empire, The Final Days of the Soviet Union, The Man with the Poison Gun, A Cold War Spy Story, and Chernobyl, which was awarded the 2018 Bailey Gifford Prize, the British Book Prize for the best nonfiction writing in the English language. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Sidhi Pluke. Professor? Oh, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hrodiski, for this uh, introduction, introduction both of myself, my work, and the book that we are going to talk about, discuss today. I also want to thank the uh, Ukrainian Institute of America, uh, the Shevchenko Scientific Society, Ukrainian Academy of Arts and Sciences, for sponsoring this event. We have been in conversation about holding this event for quite a long period of time. And then, of course, COVID interfered. And I am really very glad that we found, found the way to have it again on Zoom. And my hope is that maybe in that way, we actually even are reaching today more people than we would reach otherwise. Uh, my task today is quite easy, partially because a wonderful introduction by um, Mr. Horodesky. Uh, he already introduced the topic of the book and the, my main argument. Uh, so what I will uh, try to do today is provide more illustrations to that. And when I uh, say illustrations, I also mean some uh, actually uh, photographs. So I will uh, try uh, to share screen with you and we'll see where that brings us, whether we'll uh, get, yes, it looks like we got Perfect. exactly where I wanted us to, to be. Uh, this is a photograph that comes from, uh, from a base in Poltava. And uh, the photograph uh, is one of uh, a number of photos that I used in the book. And it comes from the Ukrainian Museum Archive in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, as you can guess, uh, given the provenance of the photograph, it was donated to the, uh, to the uh, archive uh, by one of the um, um, Ukrainian Americans who took part in this uh, shuttle missions uh, within, within the American armed forces. So uh, the story uh, of the, uh, that I'm telling in my book is uh, very um, re relevant to, to Ukraine, to Ukrainian history, but also to the Ukrainian diaspora and uh, um, uh, Ukrainian Americans. And that, is, uh, the, that photo is actually one of those illustrations. And that is, that is the reason why I wanted to start here. Um, the, um, let me see how it works. Yes, it's, <clears throat> I'm, I'm jumping, okay. Um, Mr. Horodisky already mentioned that I have written uh, on, on international history and the history of the World War II before. 
And uh, one of my books uh, on that subject, on that topic, was the book on the Yalta Conference, which was published uh, 10 years ago. And uh, the, the, the time when I did that was the time when Crimea uh, was not occupied, which was under, under Ukrainian control. And uh, one of the goals that I put in front of myself back then was also to integrate not just international history into the history of Ukraine, but also in integrate history of the Crimea. And uh, that, was, that, 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 that was done to a certain degree, but again, we know that, that developments in the last 10 years turned, turned in, the, in the way that few of us could, could predict. One of things that I lacked really when I was working on the uh, history of the Yalta Conference was a story from below, the story of the Second World War from below, which would include the people on the ground uh, who were influenced by the, by the decisions that were made by the big three at Yalta. Um, I tried to the degree possible to bring those stories in, but mostly it was the, 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 the history, the diplomatic history and cultural history, uh, looking at the war from the top. Uh, what I uh, tried to, to try to do there was also to bring the history of the, um, uh, the uh, infamous decision that was ma made at Yalta, uh, the so-called decision on the prisoners of war that really um, created a legal foundations or uh, some form of legal foundations for the actions that happened in 1945. And that meant the forceful, quote unquote, repatriation of uh, many, many um, enemies of the communist regime, including Ukrainians, repatriation uh, back to the, to, 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 to the Soviet Union or to the Soviet Union in, in case of Galicia, which wasn't part of the Soviet Union before 1939. Uh, the new book actually gave me an opportunity to really look look at uh, that history, the history of the um, shuttle bombing, but also the history of this uh, grand alliance and cooperation between the West and the Soviet Union from below, and introduce much more histories and stories of um, regular participants in the war, people whose, whose life was affected by the war, both in the military, but also on the ground, on the ground in Ukraine. As was well already mentioned uh, today, the, the, the mm, book is about a series of the shuttle bombing operations, which were called frantic. And uh, the um, uh, bombing missions were conducted from the air bases in uh, um, United Kingdom and in Italy, in, uh, mostly in Southern Italy in central part of Italy. And the reason for that was that when the missions were proposed in particularly in 1943 and then in 1944, the um, B-17 uh, flying fortresses had no problem, for example, of reaching targets in, uh, um, East Ger in Eastern Germany or in Poland or in Western Ukraine, for example, Americans were doing the bombing of Lviv in particular and then come back to their bases. But they didn't have, the US Air Force lacked at that point the um, fighters that would have enough um, um, gasoline and enough capacity to go all the way to all those destinations, protect the B-17 fortresses, and then come back. So that is, that is the, the story. The story begins in terms of negotiations in the fall of 1943. This is also where my book starts. And uh, uh, by the uh, June, late May and June of 1944, you see the first American air bases being established in Ukraine in the cities of Poltava, Mirhorod, and Peryatin. So in, in, central, in central Ukraine, in Dnipro Ukraine. Uh, and those bases continued their Two of them were closed the same year, in the fall of 1944, and one base in, in uh, Poltava lasted all the way into the June of 1945. So this is, this is the background. Those people, uh, the uh, American airmen who stuck 
at Poltava for a longer period of time, for more than one year, they called themselves forgotten bastards of Ukraine. And the term was quite popular uh, at that time among the American unions that were dumped in all sorts of remote uh, parts of the, of the front lines. There was the group that was known as FBI, Forgetting Bastards of uh, I, uh, Iceland. Uh, so the, the, the group in Poltava called themselves the Forgotten Bastards of Ukraine. And uh, when we were thinking with my publisher, the Oxford University Press, we were thinking about the proper title for the book, the idea of the, uh, the Forgotten Bastards of Ukraine came, came to the fore. And the publisher said, and I agreed with him, you know, uh, Ukraine is now in the news. With the title like that, everyone would believe that, first of all, it's about Ukraine, and second, that it's about actually uh, 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 children who are born out of wedlock. And uh, we came up with this uh, uh, version of the title, original title, which became the Forgotten Bastards of the Eastern Front, which I believe works quite well with, with, with in English, but it created a lot of problems in Ukrainian because the book was translated into Ukrainian and published in Ukrainian. And there was a nightmare of how you would translate bastards. So in the way that would also reflect reflect what, what, what is the original English or, or American meaning of that term is. So the translation eventually uh, became Zabuchi Pokichke Sidnoho Fronto. And uh, some people love it, others people hate it. So the, the, if you go online and if there is a discussion of the book, 99.9% .9 of that discussion will be the discussion of the title. But that is, that is the origin of the, of the title. This is one of the uh, B-17 flying fortresses on its way to Ukraine in uh, June of 1944. Now, the question is why Ukraine and why uh, the, the, the story of those bases are important important beyond, uh, let's say, us who would be interested in, in American bases in, in Poltava one way or another, but why, why uh, they ended up in Poltava and why it has maybe broader significance than importance and significance for us. Uh, the um, American, American uh, commanders actually were asking for more bases like that. And they were asking on the uh, northern, central, and southern parts of the, of the Eastern Front. Uh, mm, the, the Soviets didn't actually want them to give any bases at all at the beginning. Eventually, uh, Stalin agreed after prolonged, prolonged procrastination, uh, agreed to give three bases. And uh, those were uh, in the area uh, in Ukraine because they didn't want to give American bases anywhere to the north. They were preparing a major uh, offensive in uh, uh, Belarus that became known as Operation Bagration. And they didn't want to attract German attention there. So they, they decided them to push south, south uh, into Ukraine. The Americans were asking for um, bases closer to the front line, but again, they, they received no as an answer and uh, uh, was settled on this basis in, in uh, Poltava, Mirhorod, and Periatin, uh, which um, were becoming more and further and further away from the front line as front line was moving toward Lviv in, in the summer of 19. But that's, that's really almost by accident how Ukraine uh, found itself in, in, in the center of that story. Uh, in terms of the broader importance, uh, why it it's, it's really matters what happened on those bases was that that was the only case in the history of the Grand Alliance or the alliance between the United States, the Soviet Union, and United Kingdom during the Second World War. So the only case where the Eastern members of the alliance, the Soviets, and the Western members of the alliance, the Americans, were fighting actually side by side. 
There, were, there is a lot of cooperation uh, between the Americans and the British, of course, in, in Europe in particular, in North, in North uh, Africa as well. But that was the only case where the, the cooperation between East and West was happening. And that's why it was so interesting and so important to see what was actually happening on the ground. And uh, uh, the, the, the question that, that I was asking were the questions, uh, again, were already mentioned, alluded by uh, Mr. Horodisky about the, the history of the Grand Alliance. Why did it fall apart? And um, the, the uh, overall conclusions that I came up with was that um, the, the alliance fell apart not only because after the end of the war, there was no common enemy. After all, the, the American and British alliance somehow survived, but the alliance with the Soviets didn't survive. But it fell apart because of the, of the major clash clash of um, different forms of culture. And I'll, I'll tell you what that culture is, what I, what, what I have in mind. Maybe this is, this is the right image uh, uh, for you uh, to, to look at when I try to, to explain what, what I mean uh, and, and wh where my main argument. Uh, this is uh, the, the first thing that the Soviets did after retaking Poltava. Of course, they rebuilt monuments to, to Stalin. Everything else, as you can see, was, was in ruins. Uh, mm, so when I started working on, on, on that subject, I thought, well, of course, there are ideologies, right? So there is capitalism, there is socialism, there is communism, there is liberalism. And it turned out to be true to, to, to a certain degree. Then I thought, okay, there are cultural differences, right? Americans, they're, they're raised differently, there are different expectations. You can defend people when, when you don't mean to offend, there is a language barrier and so on and so forth. And uh, what I found out at the end that yes, all of those factors were there, but they were actually not in the most important ones. In terms of cultural and linguistic barrier, quite a lot of people who came there, especially those who were used as interpreters, they had roots in the, in the region, either them or their families. I already showed you one of the picture photos that was donated by a Ukrainian, and there were quite a few Ukrainians there. There were Jews, there were Russians from the white guard immigration and so on and so forth. So the, that were to a degree either linguistically or culturally adapted to the, to the situation. Uh, I also found out that the, the Americans who came to Poltava were not particularly anti-Soviet, anti the majority of them. Some were, but the majority were not. And the reason for that was first that most of them as children or in younger age, they lived through depression. So they were not really prepared to, to, to say that actually there is nothing positive at all in socialism. They were prepared to... to uh, had so, so to say open minds in, in that regard, that, that, that those open minds would be closing with every day, but they, they, they started with that approach. And uh, um, the, the, some of them again came from, from the families that had left leftist leanings, because again, some of them came from the families that immigrated before the revolution of 1917, were social democrats and so on and so forth. So if that's not, not the, 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 the big part of the story, what is the big part of the story? The biggest one is that the Americans are actually, uh, if 90% of them came as Soviet friends in 1944, 99% of them left as sworn enemies of the Soviet regime in 1945. And what they really couldn't accept was the, the uh, elements of the police state, the surveillance, the control, the lack of political freedoms, the interference in through the personal life and personal relations. So those things that I call really a clash between, uh, between uh, freedom and tyranny, that uh, it, it sounds banal, it, it sounds cliche, but I didn't start with that, with that as a hypothesis, but that's, that's where I arrived as a result of, 
of the research and, and writing that I was that I was doing. Now, uh, I I am not the first historian who uh, decided to look into the history of the um, Poltava bases. There have been at least two other books in the United States written on that subject, written on the basis of the um, uh, American archives and official histories of the Operation Frantic. What I bring to the table in this book is something that the documents that were never used before. These are the documents from the uh, archive uh, of the uh, Security Service of Ukraine, the former KGB archives, that have a collection of more than 30 volumes of the materials of surveillance by the Soviet uh, intelligence, uh, counterintelligence in the Red Army, which was called Smersh, uh, Death to the Spies. So on the one hand, and on the other hand, the materials of the surveillance of the uh, People's Commissariat for the state security. So those guys were looking after the civil Ukrainian population and their contacts with the Americans. So uh, what I'm bringing here uh, is, is, is quite unique information uh, that uh, as, as Americans suspected, they were spied on, but I don't think that they ever imagined the, the degree of how much information was collected on them and, and, and how, how, deep, how deep that uh, surveillance really went. So this is, in, this is when it comes to the, uh, the theme, the topic, the questions that I asked, the, the answers that I, I uh, came to, and uh, also the sources that I used. The book is from the very beginning uh, written with the idea that hopefully it reaches two kinds of audiences. One audience would be an academic audience, and that's where, where my argument about the importance of culture and ideology or relative importance or unimportant comes from. Another, another audience I was thinking about a broader audience. And uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Hordyski said that actually he read the book and, and he liked it. It, it, it means a lot to me because that means that non-specialists, non uh, people generally interested in that subject can, can can read the book and, and get something new. And what is there, it's also a story. There is a story of those people. I have selected a number of them. There is a story of their uh, Soviet and Ukrainian acquaintances. There is a story of love. There is a story of the, of the Soviet interference there, precluding marriages. The, 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 there is a story of connections that would last through the end of the World War II and into the Cold War. And it is that primarily aspect that I will now try to focus on in whatever time I have today for this, for this lecture. So I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'm done with uh, academic presentation of the topic and I will, I will try to tell the story with the help of the, of the images and, and photographs that, that I have here. Well, um, this is a photograph that comes from Harvard, from um, um, Davis Center uh, for the Russian Studies, the, the archive. It, it, it has been donated um, uh, by the family of uh, one of the American, uh, American participants in the uh, Operation Frantic, and I will show his uh, uh, his, his photograph uh, later, and, and, and I will talk about him a little bit more, but now I just want to talk about that image. And uh, this, uh, the, apparently it's a, uh, certainly summer, it's probably Sunday, so uh, in, in Merhorod the, the picture is taken, um, or, or maybe in, in uh, Poltava, because again, the, the officer um, uh, that, that uh, took those pictures uh, Franklin Holtzman. He was uh, stationed in both places. So what Americans found in Poltava, apart from the monument to, to uh, Stalin, was the, a lot of destruction, 
they couldn't believe that actually uh, there could be a destruction on that level. A traumatized population, first after Soviet rule, then German rule, then Soviets take over again, and a huge, huge gender disbalance. So it's basically women, it's children, and older men. And uh, again, that's that, 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 that photograph uh, probably taken on uh, Sunday at, at, at one maybe of the markets, again, in, the, in, in Mirhorod, in Piratin, or in Poltava, demonstrate that, uh, that, that, that reality of who, who are the, the, the Ukrainians, or the majority of the Ukrainians were at Poltava and Mirhorod at that time. Uh, the uh, cooperation between, between the uh, two armies uh, starts on a high note. The uh, first mission to um, Poltava is flown uh, a few days before the opening of the Second Front. Uh, the, this is the commander of the American Air Army in uh, um, um, Italy uh, at that time, uh, Ira Ikert. Well, Ira Ikert, I'm not sure how to pronounce uh, correct the name. And next to him is the Soviet commander, um, General Perminov. And uh, then uh, there is commander, uh, American commander who would replace uh, um, um, Ikert and, and, and interpreters and translators. They're attending, uh, they're attending the um, concert that was given to mark the, the start of the, of the um, operation, the, the mark the start of the cooperation between the allies. And if you are interested, you can search on YouTube and there are, uh, there are films about, about Poltava and including films that, that cover that concert in particular, because the Americans came with a lot of uh, um, cameras and, and camera operators and so on and so forth. And it was interesting to, to see what was the, the repertoire, so what was shown to them. And it's a combination, actually, of this Red Army dances and music, but also Ukrainian folklore. Uh, and some of them, like Franklin Holtzman, who loved theater, would attend the Ukrainian, uh, the Ukrainian performances also in the local theater in Poltava. Uh, so those were the, the, the happy days of, of cooperation. Uh, but they didn't last for too long uh, for a number of reasons. And one of the reasons was that I already told you that the Soviets really didn't want the Americans on the Soviet soil. Uh, they, they didn't want and needed them in particular in Ukraine. They didn't believe in the benefits of the, um, uh, this uh, long distance aviation. They never had uh, that kind of capacities. All their um, air operations were in support of the advancing armies. So they didn't have this, this either, either technology, either, either, uh, either uh, airplanes or really conceptually didn't think in those terms. So the, the Americans were their uh, nuisance. They, 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 they created all sorts of problems. And the idea was from the very beginning to isolate them not to allow them to, mm, to be with either Soviet personnel or with the local population in any informal type of context. And specifically from the very beginning, uh, the uh, special division of Smirsh of the um, uh, death to the spies um, unit was, was parachuted really to Poltava and Merhorod. And you see here uh, the um, uh, report on uh, uh, Colonel, uh, Colonel Hampton, the commander of the Poltava Air Base assigned by Major Zorin. It was in January of 1945 during the Yalta Conference. I'll talk about Yalta Conference a little bit later, uh, reporting on the, on the activities of the, of the <clears throat> Americans and American American commanders. Uh, the the um, Smersh and, and counterintelligence started to work right away, immediately already in April, even before the Americans arrived. But they were not very intrusive uh, through the first month of the operations in June of 1944. 
So uh, the, the operations went uh, more or less smoothly. As you see here, the, the, the idea was that the Americans would land on the Ukrainian air bases, they would get, get resupplied, would get bombs and so on and so forth. And this is the case where those bombs are being, being, uh, being prepared. But the, the uh, honeymoon in those relationships, so Soviet-American relations on the Poltava basis came uh, on the 22nd of June of 1945. And that's when the second, sec, uh, second Operation Frantic, they, they landed in Poltava and Merhorod. And the Germans actually um, realized what was going on. And during the night of June 22nd, 1941, they bombed Poltava, destroying good part of the American B-17 fortresses. So uh, the, the uh, disaster became known as Pearl Harbor on the steppes. So that was the second largest loss of the American airplanes on the ground since Pearl Harbor. Again, the, the numbers are not, it's Pearl Harbor is just much, much more, but, in turn, but, but still, after Pearl Harbor, uh, Americans never lost as many airplanes on the ground as it was in Poltava in June of 1940. For it turned out that the American, that the Soviet air defenses actually were not effective at all. Despite destruction of all those airplanes, not one single American, uh, um, sorry, not one single German uh, Luftwaffe airplane was shut down. So the, the accusations started going in one way and another, and the front line moved. And after the embarrassment of June 22nd, Stalin actually didn't want the Americans anymore on the Poltava basis. And what you see is they start to drag their feet in terms of the allowing, and they had control over the Americans have the right to, to fly or not to fly from those bases, they, 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 they controlled that. And they started the campaign of the embarrassing, of embarrassing and, and, and pushing out of the American uh, servicemen. And the, that campaign was, uh, um, the, okay, it's, it's not here, I'll show you later. But the, part of that campaign was that in Poltava, Mirhorod Periatin, where the Americans would date mostly Ukrainian women, those uh, in, in the public spaces, those couples would be attacked by the uh, either plain clothes uh, policemen or, or, or military or policemen in the, in the uniforms and the um, women would be attacked, which eventually led also to the, to the uh, fights between the American servicemen, despite the fact that they were under strict orders not to engage with the Soviets and uh, relations really deteriorated. Then came August of 1944 and the uh, Roosevelt wrote to Stalin uh, asking for a favor to allow American and British airplanes to use Poltava air bases to resupply the uh, Polish uh, resistance, the, 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 the participants in the Polish uprising in Warsaw that were taking place at that time. And Stalin said no. And he really had difficult time finding excuse and reason why to say no when uh, what the, the allies were asking from him is not to send his own resupplies or to advance his, uh, or speed up his advance on, on Warsaw, but to allow them to use the bases that were already there. So that the bases became even more embarrassment for Stalin. And he doesn't need to accommodate the allies anymore because the second front that he was so concerned about, that he wanted to be open, that second front is already there. It's already functioning. So the point is to, 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 to throw Americans out as soon as possible. And uh, in the fall, September and October 1944, the uh, air bases in uh, Mirhorod and Periatan are evacuated completely. And they left a skeleton, skeleton uh, crew at the, at the base in Poltava. And that American base in Poltava would last with approximately, there would be 
at the at the top of the of the operations there were more than 1000 around 1200 people at the ukrainian air bases plus the pilots and the crews that were coming there but the the, 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 the personnel on the bases was approximately 1200 after the departure of the majority of, of uh, the, the, uh, the this personnel the number of Americans that stayed in Poltava through the winter of 1945 and into the spring of 1945 was limited to 200. So this is this is a, a photograph of uh, um, the the Americans living. Uh, and again, I, I described the way how they got to Poltava, how, how they were getting from Poltava. It was through Iran. It was through Middle East. It was uh, through, uh, through the uh, um, Mediterranean, so the, those were quite, quite long, 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 long journey that those people had to make one way and then, and then another. Now that, that brings me to, to Yalta. What is the relationship between Poltava Americans and Yalta? Well, when they agreed that the next conference of the big three would take place in the Crimea, the Poltava base uh, um, personnel was put in charge of assuring the uh, arrival and then departure of um, President Roosevelt and 700 strong American delegation that came to Yalta. So the Poltava, the Poltava Americans were in charge of that operation and were present, were present at Yalta. And there were two um, documents that were signed at Yalta that directly affected what was happening at the Poltava bases in the uh, Poltava base, there would be one base by that time, at the Poltava base in the spring of 1945. One document was the document that I already mentioned to you that I tried to deal with that subject in my book on the Yalta conference, and that was signing of the document about the exchange of the prisoners of war that provided Stalin with legal grounds to claim everyone who came from the territory of the Soviet Union as decided at Yalta as allegedly a Soviet citizen. And here, this is a photograph where um, Molotov signs, signs um, uh, the same kind of a document with Anthony Eden the um, foreign secretary, UK foreign secretary, because there were two separate documents signed by the Soviets. And in my book on the Yalta conference in the caption under this photo, I make a comment saying that, well, this is one of the very few photographs of Molotov that I had ever seen where he is smiling. So he is very, really happy here to, to, to sign the document. Why the Poltava base would be involved in something like that? Well, the reason was that they would be uh, charged with the um, collecting Americans that were released by the Red Army in Poland and in Eastern Germany from the German prison camps. And the Soviets would not allow them to do that, creating a major crisis in the uh, relations between Stalin and, and Roosevelt and the Poltava, Poltava boys would be right in the middle of that. And the second document, the second document was the um, um, document on, on, the, on the frontier on the border with Poland and the uh, Poltava, Poltava uh, personnel would be flying to Lviv in particular to uh, salvage the American airplanes that were either damaged or, or were shot and, and did forced landing. And they became, they became the main source for the um, American government, collecting information on actually what was happening in uh, um, Western Ukraine and in Eastern Poland. And they documented the story how the Soviets were actually taking over the, uh, the, 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 the region uh, and, and tried their best to, kept, to keep anybody, any Western observers from the region. As I told you, I, I'm telling this story through uh, personal stories of a number of characters. And one of them um, is um, the, the uh, 
gentleman whose, whose name I uh, already uh, mentioned, Franklin Holtzman, uh, who took that picture of two uh, uh, women in embroidered shorts. Um, this, is, this is another uh, photo of Holtzman in Mirhorod with uh, one of his Ukrainian dates. And uh, he, uh, he, after his experience at Poltava, he got interested in the subject. He came to Harvard uh, to what is today Davis Center. That's where his papers are now. Uh, to get a degree in uh, the Soviet history and became an um, expert in Soviet economics. Uh, lived uh, here not far from where I live in Lexington, uh, brought back a lot of Ukrainian embroidery um, shirts and, 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 and clothes and so on and so forth. And uh, the book starts actually with his story because when in 1958 he was on the uh, research trip in the Soviet Union, he decided to stop in Poltava and he was looking for his, his girlfriend, whose name was Nina. And the KGB was following him and then filed a report and that's, that's the, the, that report from 1958 that I start, I start the story. Uh, another, uh, another interesting person who also after uh, uh, Poltava came to Harvard and they met together and he first studied the Slavic department and then was at the, at the, at the Davis Center, his name was George Fisher. And he left his memoirs, the, 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 his reports because he was uh, uh, not second in command but he was actually filing reports at the Poltava base in 1945. So, I follow also his story, which is interesting on a number of levels, but one of them is that in 1955, when he was teaching uh, Soviet sociology and economics at Brandeis University, he went to give a talk to Washington DC. And uh, uh, on the street, he was, uh, uh, on the street he encountered allegedly by chance, a person whom he knew from Poltava. And that person was Major Zorin, the head of the Smersh office, whose signature I showed you before that. And there is a story about uh, uh, Zorin now working uh, under the diplomatic cover, trying to recruit, uh, recruit Judge Fisher. And I worked with Judge Fisher's FBI file and with his memoirs. So again, uh, that, that was an opportunity to look at, at, this, at the Cold War story is already of those people from both sides using KGB documents, but also FBI documents as well. Uh, but most, most of the Cold War story in the book is about the story of the women who dated Americans, who were then harassed, whom the KGB was trying to recruit and, and followed all the way into the 1950s and 1960s. And that is, that is the, the, the uh, photo that, that um, I want to, to conclude my presentation today because it exactly deals with that story and that is, that is where the book, the book ends. So the, the main focus is on the World War II, but I'm trying to follow, to follow uh, those people into, into the Cold War. And when it comes to the American officers, I told you that 90% of them come as big friends and excited about the Soviet Union, the war effort, uh, and leave Poltava base as sworn enemies. And many of them play really important role in the start of the Cold War, including, including convincing President Truman to take a hard line or, or, hard, or, or uh, take, take a um, more, I, I, I would say uh, the, the, to, 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 to make the Soviets or try make Soviets to follow the Yalta agreements. So thank you very much for your attention. Mm, professor, that, it's a fascinating story. Um, I wanted to kind of cover a few things with you uh, before we open it up for, for general questions. Um, you, 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 hinted on a couple of side stories. So the main one being the, um, the, the cultural and social events and engagements that the American servicemen would, would uh, conduct with the local populace, uh, whether it be with women, 
uh, with, with others and so forth. Um, I found it intriguing how, from an intelligence standpoint, Smersh also used a lot of the local population as pawns to, to bring back information about certain servicemen, if not most, mm -hmm. and to use that against them and then against the locals. Um, this, this was part of their trade craft, which continued for decades after that. Um, were the Americans that you know of um, from, from your research cognizant of these activities? Because very often someone, whether it was a plainclothesman or, or, or a Soviet officer or a soldier would come by in the middle of the night and beat up on a couple, for example, or beat up on a woman. And, and uh, the Americans seemed, to, according to your narrative, seemed to be a little perplexed by that. But, but do you think that they were cognizant of the, the actual nefarious behavior behind it? Uh, well, thanks. Thank you. The, the, this is a great question. And uh, the, 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 the short answer, it depends. So the um, uh, pilots who were coming just for a few days and didn't have an opportunity to either engage with the population or the Soviet command, they were coming very excited about the mission, about the, the cooperation with the Soviets and were living with the best memories possible. Those who stayed especially this, um, the, the crew, the, the skeleton crew that stayed at Poltava and had a lot of communication with that. There are very few people actually stayed or kept their illusions. And I'm telling their story of one of people who comes with a lot of illusions. His name is William of Vasil Kaluta. Mm -hmm. And he comes uh, from according to the documents from Belarus, but the Smerz document give his nationality as a Ukrainian. He, is, he comes from a very left-leaning family. His, his father is editor of one of this uh, Russian language newspapers in, in uh, New York, which is left-leaning newspaper. They, the family immigrated before 1917. And uh, he, he almost cries at the beginning and says, okay, I want my father, my sister to be here. If they would know that I'm sitting next to the Soviet officers and, and we're having this meal, they, they would be really moved. He speaks Russian and he speaks Ukrainian. He, he is, he is, he is a, at the center of, he, he, he can play accordion and, and sing those songs. So he is, and that's why he is also at the center of the attention of Smash. Because first of all, he has too many contacts, and second, he speaks languages. Right. And the the uh, soldiers, American soldiers, who didn't know languages, they turn to him when they start encountering problems with their girlfriends. Mm -hmm. the friends are saying that we are harassed. They try to recruit us, and so on and so forth. So this very pro-Soviet person starts investigating that and, and writes this story. He becomes eventually one of the official historians of the base. That's complete change. So uh, people, people who stayed through the winter, most of them already knew what was going on. This um, uh, Franklin Holtzman, he, the, uh, he didn't know what was going on. We, we, we have him, his, uh, his um, um, letters to family. Again, it's part of the same archive. Now from the KGB archives, we know that his girlfriend broke up with him because actually they were trying to recruit her and she refused. But she never went to him, she never, she never told them. Right. So for, for, as far as he was concerned, that was a strange relationship when first of all, that woman refused to take a picture once with him. She was smart, she knew what she was doing. And second, by, by February, oh, it seems to be March of 1945, it just broke and, and he didn't know what it was. But the, the, that was a minority, most of them, especially officers, they, they, they knew what was going on. Was there any attempt- Such a degree. Was there any attempt on the American side uh, in terms of counterintelligence? I, I don't recall reading anything about that in the book, but I was wondering if there's anything that you know about that. 
Well, the, the, the Americans were coming with the uh, um, small units, which were called intelligence units. But that was a different, and the, the Soviets suspected them that those were the spies. But those intelligence units were Air Force intelligence units. Their task was to interview the pilots after the flight to, to record where the, what the, where the German positions were and so on and so forth. So the only case where there was uh, uh, people from the, it seems to me two or three officers from the, uh, uh, this uh, strategic services, from, from the intelligence. Right. It was in March uh, and April of 1945, when Stalin refused uh, uh, to allow the, the airplanes from Poltava to pick up American prisoners of war. He never understood that, why Stalin is, again, from, from, the, from the Stalin's position, the prisoners, the prisoners of war, whether they're American or Soviet, they're traitors. They, they should be treated accordingly. For, for the Americans, that's, that's of course, very different. The, the, you, 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 you treat very special prisoners of war. So there was really a cultural clash where FDR refused to understand what is going on. And he, he, um, he um, gave, gave permission to use, to, to send the officers to facilitate those operations. So not so much spying on the Soviets, but trying to get the Americans out. Um, uh, so that's, that's, that's what I, I, I uncovered. Uh, actually, it wasn't even my discovery that was already in, in the previous books on, on, on the Poltava base, the presence of those people. Another side story, uh, barely touched upon, but I found of great interest was when um, American uh, airplanes were either downed or uh, stranded on for repair in Lviv. And there was mention of contact between American servicemen and uh, members of UPA, the, uh, the insurgent army. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? What else you might know about it? Because it's, it's you know, it's also in terms of, you know, the, the new Polish front and, you know, fighting that. So I was hoping to, to kind of call a little bit more information about that engagement. Sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah, there are very interesting descriptions of uh, Lviv in 1944 and 1945 because the Americans from Poltava fly there they stay at George Hotel, George Hotel. So those who have been to, to Lviv know, know exactly where it is. So there are very interesting, uh, interesting information about Lviv. They're also the first ones who, who report on, on, on the Holocaust that happened in Lviv and in Western Ukraine. And one of the people who goes there, his name was uh, Michael Koval. And he was uh, uh, second in command at the base, uh, a Ukrainian from New Jersey. Uh, and uh, um, so, but, but the, 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 the story that, that you uh, talk about, it's, it's a little bit different. It's the story of the, uh, the, the American crews of the American airplanes that were downed by the, by the Germans. And then they had to parachute. And uh, one of those, uh, in, in one of those cases at least, uh, there was a uh, Ukrainian American who uh, believed that uh, someone was shooting at him. So that, that was the Ukrainian insurgent army, the UPA guys. And uh, then he was eventually landed and was hiding somewhere under the bush and he was discovered by those guys. And uh, it turned out that they were speaking Ukrainian. And he started speaking Ukrainian to them. So uh, in other cases where there were Americans and they were also captured by the UPA, among the UPA soldiers uh, or fighters were some who visited America, the United States of America and had relatives there and had some rudimentary English to talk to. So those guys who ended up in UPA, whether they had Ukrainian or not, they, 
Now, uh, all of these cases that I was able to find, they were uh, on the territory of what is known today as Zekerzonia. So that was the territory of today's Poland. That according to, to um, Khrushchev's agreement with, with the, the, the Lublin government in Poland was supposed to be part of, of, of Poland. And there, there was the UPA in the forest, there was the Polish police. And then on the top of that, there were the, 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 the Soviet command. And what was happening was that the UPA would then transfer those people to the Polish police and the Polish police would transfer them to the Soviets. And the, the Soviets in particular would be super suspicious about that person who was a Ukrainian, who spoke Ukrainian, because they believed that everyone was a German spy right. and that the German spy specifically uh, learned Ukrainian to, to fool them. So, uh, but, but again, those were really very interesting story where the, the, the American, uh, Amer American mm -hmm. pilots ended up in, in, in the fight. In Upa custody. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Ah, here we go. Uh, from Philip, I uh, has two questions. Uh, the first is the origin of the title "Forgotten Bastards." The U.S. troops on Bataan in 1941-42 had the phrase battling bastards of Bataan. Uh, ain't got no papa, no mama, no uncle Sam. I'm afraid that's all we have here. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, again, I, I, uh, I, I didn't know about that continuation that we have no papa, mama, or uncle Sam. But I, at, the, at the beginning uh, of, of my uh, presentation, I talked that, again, the forgotten bastards was the, the uh, definition, self-definition that was used by a number of American units that were somewhere allegedly forgotten. Mm -hmm. uh, what I can add, and in that sense, again, the forgotten bastards of, of Ukraine, they call themselves not forgotten bastards of Eastern Front, but forgotten bastards of Ukraine is what was one of, it was one of those cases. What is interesting, what I can add to, to what I said before was that at some point uh, they were also, uh, there was a temp to, to, someone was calling them, you're not forgotten bastards of Ukraine, you are the fighting bastards of Ukraine. Hmm. So there, there was a kind of a, a, a additional, a, a, a additional layer of, 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 of uh, maybe, I don't know, complexity or meaning that, that, that was added to, to that term. But yes, absolutely, that was not unique for, for that. Uh, forgotten bastards was not unique definition for that group in Ukraine. Here's a comment from Stan. Uh, so if the Americans were free to travel as far down to Crimea in 1944, they probably witnessed the mass deportation of Crimean Tatars. Uh, which is quite inspiring for further research or even historical fiction. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the, their, their uh, ability to travel was really limited. The report, the uh, smash report that I showed to you from the time of the Yalta conference, that was actually a complaint that the commander of the uh, Poltava base who without the Soviet permission actually flew to, to Saki in, in, in Kiev. But uh, that being said, certainly there was, a lot of, there was a lot of communication. I didn't find anywhere in, in uh, sources where I was working on that, that there was understanding that there were Crimean Tatars before, before uh, 1944. And uh, from uh, my work on the book on the Yalta conference, I can tell that uh, the, the big three uh, and the people at the top of the American or British delegation also don't talk about that, presumably don't know about them. What they comment on is the destruction. And they attribute all of that destruction to the German occupation. When in reality, the, 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 the villages are empty because the people were were settled already by, by, the, by the Soviet administration. 
There is a uh, anonymous uh, question indicating, unless I mis misheard, you mentioned a Holocaust in Lviv. Can you elaborate? I believe that's just a mistake and uh, a, a mistake because uh, the from from what we gather, there was reporting uh, coming from there for the first time about the Holocaust, uh, but not a Holocaust in view. So that was just a clear, clear clarification. Uh, Philip has a second question. No, no, no. I, 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 oh, if you don't mind, I, I, I can comment. Oh, go ahead. Uh, they were they were the first to report on the Holocaust in in region uh, in Lviv and in region. And uh, the the information was coming uh, mostly from the uh, from uh, a few surviving Jews that they encountered, and uh, also from the Poles and the Polish uh, Polish uh, professors from the university and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, it's interesting that the story that they told in that story exists only Poles, Germans, and Jews. There is no Ukrainians. So again, it's it's uh, either it's the story of the Holocaust or the story of, in Lviv. They they don't write that they encounter any Ukrainians, and maybe they don't, or maybe just uh, like with the Crimean Tatars, there is no the, the, there is no enough knowledge or understanding that, that is supposed to be there. Very good. Uh, Philip has a second question. Uh, the four U.S. B twenty nine bombing in Japan. I think bombers, uh, he's just trying to say in Japan, the crash landed in the Far East were exploited to create the Soviet Tu-4 nuclear bomber. Was there any attempt by Soviets to exploit the B-17 for their use? That's a I, I don't know. I don't know about that, but I know that uh, the uh, there were uh, a particular particular. Um, technological innovations for a precise bombing that the American, some of the American airplanes had, and the Soviets didn't have that. And there was an episode where the, one of the American airplanes with that particular equipment was, was uh, forced to, la to land on the Soviet territory and the Soviets actually didn't let it fly from that area before they examined everything and actually took all the measurements and so on and so forth. So that's that's the only, uh, again, for, from my research on that particular book, the only thing that I know where, where the Soviets were certainly trying to take advantage legally or illegally, trying to get their hands on the, on the um, um, American, American um, technological discoveries and innovations. I hope that uh, answers Philip's question. Uh, very good. My my last question to you is more about um, the process of of historical research, and more specifically, and also from a personal um, observation, I find much of your texts to be very readable. Uh, and what, what I mean by that is, I feel like I'm reading a story, a narrative that, that has some very personal elements um, tied to, to, the, uh, to the actual history at hand, but that you have this kind of um, storytelling method that's very uh, intimate. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your approach to, to writing? Um, does that kind of, is it planned specifically during research or is it something that comes after research, post-research? Uh, well, um, um, I, I would say that this is, this is something that I, I try to get better at. Uh, this is something that they don't teach you in graduate schools. The, 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 the point is to be good researcher and to be good scholar. And uh, what I'm trying to do, at least in the last 10 years, uh, is to write books like the one that, you, the, the, that we are discussing today. That would work, as I said, to, for both audience. That would be respectable scholarship. And again, 
the fact that it is published by Oxford University Press is at least one indication that it fits on, on a certain level that, 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 uh, the, the, that requirement. And also something that would be would, would reach broader audience. Uh, and uh, uh, how to do that? You you have to. I, I I'm I'm trying to. I my my first book of that kind was the book on the Yalta Conference. Mm. So I was rewriting it many times. Uh, this another book uh, that uh, I moved further toward the popular audience was the book The Man with the Poison Gun where again, I had to do a lot of rewriting. So, so it's a process. And uh, you never really know how it will turn out. You want to, to reach both audiences and theoretically it can become something that neither of the audiences is, is satisfied. So it's always, it's always a challenge. Mm -hmm. And I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful for your comment. And I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that in your opinion that that book works on that level. And the level of storytelling as well. Indeed, because it's it's all a story. I mean, it's a story about you know living history and society, mm -hmm. its legacy. We have an additional question from Yuri. Uh, could you please speak about your current work, uh, most unexplored areas of Ukrainian history that may require attention? Uh, your view. It, it, it is a good question. And uh, um, basically, th there is a lot of things that that worth exploring and, and, and worth researching. Uh, the the uh, themes that really now come to the fore very much are the themes associated with the Second World War. Uh, the, the themes associated with World War II in Ukraine. Uh, the Polish-Ukrainian relations, the, the uh, uh, massacres in Volhynia and the conflict there. The, the, uh, um, so the, the, the story of the war that is not traditional story of the war in a sense of the clash of the military formations. And uh, uh, I, if, if you look at the books written on the history of Ukraine, probably the majority would be, would be dealing with the Second World War one or another, but it doesn't mean that the, the, research, is, the research is complete. Another, another big theme that is out there is the history of the Holodomor. And on the one hand, there is a lot of interest and research went into that. But if you compare, for example, the level of the development of the history of the Holocaust, the methods that are used, the, the, the kind of questions that are asked, we, in the history of Holodomor, there is a lot of, the, a lot of work to be done. Uh, and in the history of Holocaust as well, uh, when it comes to Ukraine. So the, the, these are themes that are really in the make, make headlines when it, comes, when it comes to history today. Uh, but uh, there are uh, really uh, uh, the, 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 the new maybe front in that, in, in, the, in that story, which is not so political, maybe not so visible, doesn't make headlines, but is really very important. And that's where the, the history is moving now and where I was trying making maybe some small steps in this book. And this is the history of the everyday life. That's, that's moving beyond the history of the big man. It's, it's looking into what is, what is happening with the, uh, with the uh, average person and every person, average person's experience, the, the family, the, the, the emotions, uh, the um, history of, of uh, women. We, there is very little written about uh, women in, in, in Ukrainian history, uh, again, Marta Bohachevsky Khomyak is a pioneer there, and her, her leadership is very much appreciated in Ukraine. We are publishing now Ukrainian translation of uh, Oksana Kisi's book on women in Gulag. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, that's, that's just the start. This is the beginning. And again, these are themes that are not politically as prominent as World War II, Holocaust, or Holodomor but are very, really important in terms of understanding of our own history, family history, where 
personal history, family history, the history of the world comes together. So that is that is where I think a lot of future there and a lot of discoveries to be made. Philip has another question. Um, he asks whether you have considered writing a book on the war in Donbass, particularly the Russian invasion of late August 2014 and winter offensive of 2015. Thank you. Uh, well, um, I, I, I thought about that, and uh, but I didn't think for, for, for a lot because um, every, every discipline has its, its uh, pluses and, and has edge, but also has limitations. And uh, uh, history is, is the, the kind of a discipline where we really very much rely on the archives. Mm -hmm. This book in particular is based on the archives. And uh, uh, when it comes to the recent event or contemporary events, that's where the, the journalists or anthropologists or sociologists or political sciences, the people in political sciences really lead. And it, it doesn't mean that uh, good history, contemporary history is not, is not uh, impossible. Uh, but it's it's a difficult without without access to the archives because our wisdom of as the historians come not from our kind of a supreme ability to to see or understand but from our access to the to the to the archives and also from the benefit of the hindsight we, or, or we know what already happened to those people who were in the forty three still didn't know whether they would survive the next day or not. Right. So, um, and uh, uh, so I, I'm, I'm really, I'm really waiting for, for the, the time when I would be able to access, even, even from one side, let's say from Ukrainian side to access the, the, the documents and materials and who was making the decision and how they were made and what, what information was available. Miroslava asks, what is the tentative title of your next book? Well, it's not, it's not tentative. Let me show it just a, just a sec. I will, I will leave you for, for one moment. Okay, the secret relieved. Nuclear folly. Uh, a history of the Cuban Missile Crisis, where you wouldn't believe there is a very, very important Ukrainian story. Again, uh, the, the, the benefit of access to the to the KGB archives in Kiev because every single missile that was delivered to Cuba was made in Ukraine. 80% of the um, missiles and, uh, were taken from Ukraine, from Kharkiv, oblast from uh, Sumshina, and were shipped through the Ukrainian ports. And each of those ships had a KGB officer who was diligently writing down what was going on and sending these things first to Odessa and then to Kiev. So there is, there is an absolutely unknown Ukrainian part of the, of the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis story. I can uh, give you just a general idea. The decision to shut down the American U-2 over Cuba that almost caused a nuclear war uh, was made by two generals and the first name, the last name of first general was Harbuz and the last name of the second gentleman was uh, Hrechka. So the Ukrainians were really overrepresented that the commander of the uh, nuclear forces there was uh, a native of Chernobyl, General Stetsenko. So there is a lot of Ukrainian themes and Ukrainian connections there that I'm trying to, to, to bring to the fore in this book. You just spoiled the plot for me. Now I'll just have to wait for the <laughs> film to come out. Okay, well, it, it will be in April. It will be out in April. Professor Plucky, 
we're very grateful for you uh, and your attendance tonight. Uh, your, your presentation was enlightening and also shed additional <clears throat> um, additional light on, on uh, already read books. So, so we thank you very much. Um, I'd, I'd like to also thank all the attendees for, for participating and for listening in tonight. Without participants like you, we wouldn't be able to do our events here at the Ukrainian Institute, especially now that everything is virtual and, 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 and uh, by a computer. So we thank you for that. If you haven't read the book, I urge you to do so. It's, it's a fascinating read and you'll learn a little bit of this history that, that's not in the, uh, in the fore of the, uh, cult, in, of the, of the predominant culture. Um, if, if you'd like to order it, you can go back on our um, announcement page and there's a link to Amazon or you can order it through your own bookstore. So, so thank you again, everyone. And uh, if you'd like to learn more about the Ukrainian Institute of America and its programming, please go to ukraininstitute.org and you'll see uh, information of current and upcoming events. Again, thank you everyone for your participation and Dr. Uh, Pluke, thank you again as well. Hope to see well, you thank soon. Thank you. Thanks a lot for organizing this event and thanks for your questions. We'll see you soon. Thank you much.